I'd like to start by reading Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So far the reading of the word of God. As we continue our subject of the Holy Spirit, His activity and leading, I would like just to summarize very briefly what we saw yesterday and we really started at looking what is really the challenge here. What is the problem? What is the practical aspect of this subject? This is where, where we started because that motivates us in some ways even more to, to better understand what we have before us, the significance of, of this great subject. And we said that the the leading of the Holy Spirit really determines if we live a successful life or not. Because everything depends on that. God created us with a, with a purpose. And He wants us to walk according to His will. And in order to know His will, we need to be led by the Spirit. And we have to have a, a certain understanding of the person of the Holy Spirit, which dwells actually in every believer. And we said that there is a struggle going on between the spirit and the flesh. And we didn't look at it in much detail yet. But uh, we realize it very practically in our lives, I guess. And it is something that is the reality of each one of us. And so then we, we looked at the person of the Holy Spirit. And we wanted to understand a little bit how he was actually there from the beginning of the first uh, pages of the Bible till the last pages where the, the bride cries come and the spirit cries come, where there's this joint desire for the one that will come soon. And we saw that the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would come upon people at times, even unbelievers at times, but would withdraw himself also. He was acting uh, in a direct way, we can say, on earth, but he was not dwelling on earth because the work of Christ had not been uh, accomplished. And it is only after the cross that the Holy Spirit could come down and baptize out of the Jews and Gentiles into one body all those people, all these beloved children of God that were gathered through the cross of Christ into this oneness. And so we have now the assembly that is indwelled also by the Spirit. So not only are we indwelled individually, but also the assembly collectively is indwelled by the Spirit. And we are going to, to look at it a little bit also this afternoon. The Holy Spirit now dwells on the earth. And that is what characterizes this time of grace, the dispensation at which we live now. And that's a wonderful thing, because the Lord Jesus said it was expedient to the disciples that he would go away so that the Holy Spirit could come down and that he would then abide with us forever. And that means we are totally equipped to live victorious lives. There is no lack. 
And we consider it the effects that it will have when the Holy Spirit is now having all the liberty. We spoke about the fact that it can be, the Holy Spirit can be uh, grieved and, and, and quenched. Grieved maybe more with regard in individuals and, and the quenching aspect maybe with regard to the collective and the collective assembly. But that is, of course, something that is very sad. And we have read those verses where it shows us how he can be grieved and also what is the, um, the things that we, the, the encouragements that we have, the exhortations actually, so that we will not grieve the Holy Spirit. We would like to live victorious lives. And for this, we need to make room in us. And we said yesterday that uh, it is not that we wait for the Spirit now to, to come and fill us again from, from like something, an influence coming from extern. That he has not been given to us in a measure only. We have the Holy Spirit as a person in us. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And therefore we should glorify God in our bodies. And so the question now is not of getting more of the Holy Spirit or having a second experience or anything like that. It is really to make room in us. We are like vessels, and if we fill other stuff in the vessel, there's no room then for the Holy Spirit. But if we then judge ourselves, if we judge that which needs to be judged, well, then there is room again. If we yield ourselves to the Lord, we give our lives to the Lord consciously and, and willingly, and we, we do this uh, willfully, then there is room. And the Holy Spirit fills us. It's something that is at the reach of every one of us. In the Old Testament, it was the sovereign work of God. He would come down on a Saul, even unbeliever. He would come down on David. And they would prophesy. That was the sovereign work of God. Now, today, it is totally our responsibility to be filled with the Spirit. That's why the Scripture tells us, be filled with the Spirit. So, let's do our morning devotions. Let's have a constant... Uh, <coughs> Constant relationship with the Lord, consciously. Let us be all time in prayer, which means in this prayer attitude. These natural reflexes. And let's keep our lives clear before the Lord. Let's put the Lord first. Very consistently, the Lord first. In every decision that we take. That is important. And if we do this, well then, the Holy Spirit will have free sway in our lives and we will be witnesses because that is why the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples, so that they would be witnesses of the resurrection of Christ and we will be gospel-minded people, we will be people that live in reality, that don't live for their own careers, for their own pleasures, for their own goals, but they will, will be people that will be characterized that we live for the goals that are for the glory of the Lord. And so that he might see fruit of the travail of his soul. That is what the Holy Spirit does. He works in this world. We saw his passive witness. We saw his active witness. We saw that he does his own work by his presence, we could say. But on the other hand side, he does his own work in an active way and he uses redeemed people like you and me. Those that just know the preciousness of having been bought with the precious blood of the Lamb. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And if you now say, well, I'm not very gospel-minded, then that's bad news because that means that the Holy Spirit doesn't have that liberty in your life. If you say, I, I really, I don't have that heart. I don't really care about the other people. I wouldn't say it that way, but in my life, that's how it is. I don't have that urge 
to use the opportunity and to find opportunities to share the Lord with somebody. If you say that's your reality, then that means the Holy Spirit doesn't have really that liberty in your lives. And in my life, that is a challenge. Because we know there's times, at least that's my experience, where we are, you know, fire for the Lord and we have that before us and we, and we, we use, we want to see those opportunities and we realize, well, I don't have tracks in my car or whatever. There's something wrong here. I, 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 I missed this opportunity again. And, and we have these, these reactions, these, I would say, the, the Lord is speaking to us in a conscious way and, and, and showing us, putting the, the finger on, on, on the problem. And there's other times when we just maybe don't care. We're so busy with our own stuff and our own goals and our own visions. And, and that is very revealing where we stand. And you would probably see that this goes along with a whole set of other problems. It's not just being gospel-minded, but it goes along with a load of other problems in our lives. Our devotions wouldn't be the same, probably, if we're in that state, and we'll have more trouble with other people and in the family, and so on. It reflects everything. And saints, this is a very serious subject. It is very challenging to speak about it even, because... We feel so weak. And yet, the word of God gives us here encouragements. Verse 29 of Ephesians 4 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that may minister grace unto the hearers. <laughs> That's not just when we preach or present the word or so. That is all the time. That is something that, that is for every one of us. And that verse in itself could be a challenge for the whole life. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We are in a world where we're constantly tickled with some kind of news, some new little film here, some new little thing on YouTube here and there and so on, all the time. And it always is on the negative side almost. Not really so much for edification. Sometimes also great speeches, but then in a natural way, not spiritual edification. And... Then it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption, in view of that which is coming. In chapter 1, I referred to that verse yesterday. It says in verse 13, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, or having believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, until the praise of his glory. We, show, we see how, it, how it's really looking to the future, how it's looking to that blessed day, even the millennium, when, when the millennium will be installed and the inheritance will be ours. But, you know, when we look here in chapter 4, we see verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. You see what's happening here? It is all those things that grieve the Holy Spirit. That we are being said that we have to be careful with that. All bitterness. Do you have bitterness in your life? Do you have been wronged by somebody? Terribly wronged at some point in your life and you can't get over it and you chew it in your thoughts over and over and over. And there's a root of bitterness that springs up in your heart. It says, let all 
bitterness and wrath and anger and glamour and evil speaking be put away. And there's the root of bitterness, then there many get defiled. Why? Because it's constantly there, this little fire that makes this tongue move. And that tongue says all kind of stuff. And then many get defiled. That's all stuff that is really grieving the Holy Spirit, is grieving the Holy Spirit in our lives, is grieving the Holy Spirit in other lives who receive those words and are the ones that will now carry it to the next person. And this is the kind of atmosphere that then happens. It can be in a local assembly. In a local local assembly, it can go beyond that. And that is a very serious thing because it takes power away. If you look in the book of Acts, the first Christians were were totally... um, characterized by unity. They were in one place with one accord, and then the Holy Spirit came down. Chapter 2. And when you see the same thing in chapter 4, and you see again that the, 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 the place was shaken and so on, and that there was manifestations of the Holy Spirit, it is because they were of one heart and one mind. And if we are not of one heart and one mind, we will not see any power. And who of us would not desire to see power again? Power in our own lives, power in our assemblies, power wherever we are. See the Holy Spirit work. Tell me, is the Holy Spirit less powerful today as he was in the beginning? Of course not. It's the same blessed divine person. So you will say, well, we live in the last days. Yes, we do. So the last days are, are responsible. Who is the last days? I mean, it's just the time which we live, right? And where Christianity and is, is, has come down quite a bit. But the last days are not responsible because the Holy Spirit is there and we are still normal people and still the temple of God and the Holy Spirit is in us. And so now if there is no power, there is a problem and the problem lies in my own heart, in my own life. I am responsible, not the last days. But I live in a surrounding that has a tremendous effect on me. And that's why we live in a constant fight that is a terrible struggle. And then we have those little machines, those, this technology that is so helpful for so many things. Because in our stressful world of today, how would we survive without such a machine like a a phone, smartphone, right? And they help us so much. And yet, at the same time, there are such great dangers. And we need to go before the Lord as parents with regard to our kids. And as young people, with regard to the liberty that we now maybe have from our parents. And as older folks that have the same access, all of us, basically, to all the evil in the world. Every perverse imagination of man. And we need to ask ourselves... How do we handle this? Because if we speak of the Holy Spirit today, and we want to see power, we need to speak about phones. Imagine that. We need to speak about about technology. We need to speak about this, because that is one of the most grieving, probably, uh, sources when it comes to grieving the Holy Spirit. Is a terrible thing. Because it can be just in a so-called harmless way. It could be that it just occupies us with harmless earthly things that are not bad in themselves, not very bad. Let's put it this way. I speak very down to earth now. And yet they take all the time, the little time, the little, little time that we still have to maybe study the word. But brothers, 
If you don't study the word, who is going to speak from this pulpit in a few years? And sisters, if you don't study the word, how are your children going to get anything in terms of values of Christ himself? We need brothers who know the Lord. Not just are Christians, that are saved. I'm, I'm saying who know the Lord. Through the word. And through experience. And we need sisters who cling to their loving Savior. As they struggle to educate and navigate their children in this evil world. That's what we need. If we want to see halls that are being filled, not emptied, not the general trend of today, because that's the general trend of today in most churches. And now we talk not only assemblies that understand something about being gathered unto the name of the Lord Jesus, we speak in a general way. That's a general trend. But you have some churches that actually get filled. There's something happening. And I'm not talking about mega churches. Now I'm speaking about some churches that have some healthy gospel outreach and some healthy ministry of the Holy Spirit in their midst. And there's assemblies that do grow even in this world today. And where the last days are not accepted as an excuse. And saints, if we want to see growth today, we all know it is not going to be growth like in the very beginning 2,000 years ago. We don't expect this maybe. But we expect that there is still growth possible today. Because it is still the same Holy Spirit that still reaches out in the world and wants to gather for Christ a bride. And he wants to use you and me. And he wants your children to be part of that. My children to be part of that. So this is the challenge. How do we deal with technology today? You know, in some reasons, I said some of it might be earthly things. Some of it might be way worse. And radical amputation is needed in that case. Nothing less but that. Radical amputation. It means that we have to put aside the things that are trapped for us in our lives. If we, if we take it for granted that the Holy Spirit is constantly grieved in our lives, we we can just forget everything. We could just stay home. And we are going to lose our kids. But if by the grace of God, we still have before us that we really want the Holy Spirit to have a free course in our lives and to be really there, then we have to do something. And that is radical amputation. We have to put things aside. We have to put either filters or we have to put the whole thing away for a while. Or we have to find solutions. We have to, to make ourselves accountable to a brother. And first and foremost, of course, we must get right with the Lord first. But in some areas of what I'm talking right about now, you, we need external help. That is a reality. Now... It says here, be ye kind one to another, verse 32, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as, even as, also, God in Christ has forgiven you. That's the measure. You have quarrels with somebody? Is there any quarrels between somebody? Tensions? These things exist. We have to forgive. 
forgive and forgive again. Because Christ forgave us, although there was nothing in us that made us so worthy of forgiveness. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. And we will see a very practical thing. You know what we try now to do sometimes is now we will say, now I'm going to try really hard to not grieve the Spirit. And I don't want to encourage anybody to do that. The Galatians had one problem. They thought it was possible to still live by law. They started by with the Spirit, but they thought then they could still do it in their own strength and having regulations. When I speak of radical amputation, this is just a little help that must be there at some point, maybe in some situation, but this is not the solution. The solution is a different one. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, that verse which we had from the beginning, It says, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, it's not not trying not to go on that website anymore. It's not trying to not do this or that thing anymore. It is something where we replace that evil thing at the same time. You see, the mortifying part is one aspect. And it is necessary. But the victory comes only through the Spirit. Let's read verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are under Ye are not under the law. This is the secret. If we are led by the Spirit, we are not under the law. That is something that is incompatible. You cannot have both at the same time. Cannot be under the law and led by the Spirit. That is not possible. It's either the one or the other. And there's so many, even unfortunately Christian leaders, that will put their... The, the congregation that they have around them under laws and under regulations and under rules and not realizing that this is not the solution. And the moment, the moment they tell them, for example, that they are really saved for all eternity, then all the worldliness pops up and they completely change, sometimes so godly externally. Through rules, I say. And they have no idea how they could. And that's why some, even some keep that doctrine that you can lose the salvation to keep people in fear, although they themselves know better. Even that is, 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 is something that exists. And it's just an example to show, and they say, how do you do that? I had a, 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 a leading brother in, uh, amongst, it was in, in Russia it was, and, and he asked me, he said, how and he was from some, some uh, um, Russian Baptist background. And he said, how do you do that when you preach that, um, that once you're saved, you're really saved? How do you do that, that people don't become totally worldly, you know, when you say that? That's, that's the experiences. Wherever this doctrine comes in, then the whole congregation turns one time into something very worldly. Well, it is not by rules and regulation that we, we are being kept. We are only kept by the Spirit and by realizing that we love Him because He loved us first. And we realize that friendship with the world is enmity against God. I mean, these are things that we just need to feel. And if we are close to the Lord, we will feel that Worldliness is not that which is right. It's enmity against God. It is that which is totally opposed to God. And saints, there again, where are our hearts? If our hearts go after the things of the world, even the things of this earth, 
If our hearts are drawn by these things, then it means that the Holy Spirit does not have much power in our lives. That's a reality. You can't have both. And in Philippians, there is this devastating phrase which speaks of those that mind earthly things. And they are called, let's, let's just read that, because I just want to show that even earthly things are not uh, to be taken lightly. Chapter 3. Verse, uh, we could read from verse uh, 15 just for the context. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same things. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, so certainly not believers, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, and then it says here, who mind earthly things. Saints, this is very sobering. And we are oftentimes even minding worldly things. But even earthly things can be such a hindrance in our lives. Now, how do we, how do we find strength and how do we overcome? In chapter 5 of Galatians, We have now read that we should walk in the Spirit and we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In chapter 6 and verse 7 we read, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Saints, we are in the New Testament, not in the Old Testament. We sow what we, we reap, what we sow. And as somebody said, later than we sow, and more than we sow. That's the principle. We reap what we sow, later than we sow, and more than we sow. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Saints, that is so simple. And we should just think about it for a minute. Just take that little time now and think in your own lives, what are you sowing? What am I sowing? Everywhere, when you sow wheat, you, receive, you, you reap wheat. When you sow barley, you, you, you reap barley. That is how simple it is. You reap what you sow. And how is it that we in the spiritual world, we now think that we could reap something worldly, something earthly, and that we could uh, sow, I mean, that we could sow something earthly, something worldly, and that we could reap something spiritual. You know, we just love at times to live in our fantasies. And the enemy is constantly 
bringing us to live in a fantasy world. And when I say fantasy world, I just mean not in reality. That's what I mean. He just wants us to believe that we live in a world where everything is insecure and there is lots of problems and lots of dangers and we are totally exposed to all of that and we are really people that better pull up our socks and do something. And we forget that there is a loving Father in Heaven that has everything under control. And that's why we need all kinds of things In the fantasy world, there's a lot of advertisement. And that advertisement wants us to think that we need so many things. And then only we might be a little more secure. And yet, we are perfectly secure because we are in the hands of a loving Father that is almighty. Who owns the thousand cows on the hill or the cows on the thousand hills. Saints, we need to be staying in reality. And reality is this. We reap what we sow. So go through your life now and think. Are you sowing for the spirit or are you sowing for the flesh? Because all day long we are sowing some kind of speed. We have seed. We have two baskets. And we have one basket with seed for the flesh and one basket with seed that is spiritual. And now we are sowing all day long. Whatever we do, we are sowing. The question is, what kind of seed are we sowing? And what do we want to reap? Just have to go from the harvest side to understand what we need to sow, right? So, go through your life now. In your mind. Tomorrow is Monday. And then the week. And then the month. And then the year. What kind of seed are you sowing? Am I sowing? That is the challenge. God is not mocked, it says. We reap what we sow. Whatsoever man shall soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, the question is, where does the strength come from to live a life as a Christian of liberty, of freedom, and of peace? Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 2. Romans 8 verse 2 says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's wonderful. This is reality. This is not something that... We need to try or we need to work for. This is something that is reality, saints. This is what it is. Chapter 7, you have all the struggle of this poor man that always tries and never gets to what he would like to do. And the conflict is terrible. Maybe somebody is here that is in that state. He says, I try, I try, I try. And never do what I want. Well, it's good that you can say what I want, because if you want that which is godly, it means the life of God is in you. It means the Spirit is in you. It means there is already a good desire that's wonderful. But now there is this struggle with the flesh. And the more you fight the flesh, the stronger it seems to become. And the more you you put yourself under rules and regulations and you try to overcome this time real. And with that new rule the stronger somehow this flesh also becomes and the sin becomes more apparent in your life and you you could despair until you come to chapter 8 and you say, oh, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free 
There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And then you go to verse 13. And there we find a principle. It says, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. You know that this expression means ye are about to die. Ye are about to die. It's just that if ye live after the flesh, ye are about to die. But if ye, through the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You see, this is the key for freedom. Practically speaking, this is the key. So, we are, if we had read in, in Galatians, we would have seen the, 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 uh, the works of the flesh and the deeds of the flesh and so on, that we have to mortify and all these things. And if we try mortifying, mortifying all the time, then we would despair. It goes differently. We do have to mortify, that's what we are told in Scripture, but how do we do it practically? It is here that you find that. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit... Do mortify the deeds of the body you shall live. You see what's happening here? You replace, so to speak. You, 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 what you do is, we live by the Spirit. We do the next step with Him. And by doing that, that next step is already not a fleshly thing. It's a spiritual thing. And as I've done that next step with the Spirit, I then look to the Lord and I do the next step by the Spirit again. And as I do this, this is another step that is not a fleshly one, but a spiritual one. You see what is happening here? I mortify the rest. My old man has already died, right? And the flesh has no occasion now to pop up again. Because I'm walking in the Spirit now. One little step after the other. And as long as I'm doing this, there's no chance for the flesh to have anything, any space to do anything wrong. That is freedom. When I realize this is something that the Lord, the possibility to do this is something that the Lord acquired at the cross. He conquered sin. He was made sin for us. So that sin now does not need to have power. Cannot. We don't need to give it power in our lives anymore. Because the, the power has been taken care of. We have a greater power in our lives. And that's the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful thing. So we have a new object now. We have a new object before our eyes. When you look in that well-known verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, you see that the transformation that I'm talking about now here happens in that way that we look to the man in the glory. It says, we all, 2 Corinthians 3.18 we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Lord the Spirit. You see that? We look outside of us. Stop looking inside. We look outside and we look to heaven and now we see at the right hand of the Father the man in glory. And we look into his wonderful face. And we are transformed ourselves by this from glory to glory. But for this we have to look up. Look up! Not down on your phone. Look up. People are always walking like this through the streets. And me too, at times. It's just unbelievable. How many times we look down instead of looking up. 
And as we look up, we are being transformed from glory to glory. And we are walking by the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. And we find strength. So what we have now, we have an object outside of us, Christ, the man in the glory. And we have a new power within us. And that is the Holy Spirit. Now, unfortunately, time is gone. And I had promised yesterday that I wanted to speak also for the sisters, especially in the ministry, in the meeting. But that's a subject we need to keep for another time, I guess. But I would say this. When it comes to the leading of the Spirit in the assembly, just these two remarks. Number one, the assembly is not just assembly meetings. Okay, this is number one. The assembly is not just assembly meetings, saints. It is when you and I, we all are part of the assembly. We are all members of the assembly. And what, what is happening is this. When it says that everything should be done for the edification, it is something that is not just the thing of the brothers. I want this to underline very clearly. Because we have, sometimes we might think, okay, uh, we just come to the meetings, there's the assembly meetings, like breaking of bread and the ministry of the word and the, the prayer, prayer meetings, and there the sisters from Scripture we know, 1 Corinthians 14 and other verses, everybody has his role, and so the sisters are not heard, and so sometimes the sisters think that their ministry within the assembly meetings is not necessary. Sisters, when you pray with the assembly, you pray just as much as every brother, and is just as precious to the Lord, it's just not audible, that's all. But let's keep one thing clear. It is that ministry for edification is something that is being exercised by those that have been gifted in different areas. And every one of us has been gifted in some area. Every one of us has received a gift by the Spirit. And so the Spirit wants to use us. You and you and you and you and me. Brothers and sisters alike. And now we need to realize this, that as sisters, you have a tremendous role and tremendous ministry opportunities. That is the one point that I can only hint now. But it is outside the assembly meetings, but there's so many things that need to be done. You know that most of the people get saved, not in gospel preachings, but on personal contacts. Do you know that a brother cannot do pastoral work properly speaking with a sister? If sisters need pastoral attention, it needs to be another sister. Why is it that older sisters are asked or told to be uh, teachers of good things? And sisters, I know, you say, okay, but that's not for me, I'm not an older sister yet. I'm 65 only. Not yet older sister. And then when you reach the 85 and you, suddenly, you finally maybe see that you might be part of the older sisters, then the strength is not there anymore as it used to be. I'm very practical. If it says the older women in scripture should teach the younger women, well, uh, just take it that way. If you're a little older than somebody else, that is, that is wonderful. You can already call, you know, see yourself with that responsibility, not as being old, but as being responsible to pass on that which the Lord has given you. That is so important. Are there the teachers of good things here tonight or this afternoon? You don't need to be old in the sense how we would say today to do that blessed service, but it's a ministry that only sisters can do. That is so important, okay? That is number one. Secondly, what I'd like to say with regard to the assembly, 
ministry, it is that the leading of the Spirit is not different in assembly meetings than in the rest of the life. Sometimes there is this concept that, oh, I'm sitting here now and I need to be led by the Spirit because that is now the assembly meeting and that is very different. And for younger brothers at, at, at times, that is, it is really making it difficult. Saints, if we are led by the Spirit during our everyday life for every little step that we do, then we'll be able also to call out the right hymn. But we need to be led by the Spirit. We need to be led by the Spirit. In assembly meetings, as in our lives every day. Because only then we will see the power of the Spirit displayed. Only then we will see fruit. We have to ask ourselves, really, before the Lord. Lord, do I see fruit in my life? You know, these questions we don't ask so, so easily. And we are not taught so much to ask them. And we don't want to think about us. We want to look to the Lord, right? But at times we have to sit down and we have to, to just think about this as well. Do I see fruit in my life? What's going wrong? And I know the fruit of the Spirit and then we have these different attributes. And it's wonderful to see those nine aspects in our lives. If one is lacking, it's not the fruit of the Spirit anymore. So it's not just about character or something where we, you know, we have a nice, gentle character and so we always seem to be so spiritual. That's not what's meant with the fruit of the Spirit. It is transforming power. It is, it's the choleric who is suddenly characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. And it is also the phlegmatic that is characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. He's getting active when he would stay maybe more passive. So it's not about psychology, it's about the fruit of the Spirit, regardless of our dispositions, how the Lord created us. So important. That's the fruit of the Spirit. But when we talk about fruit, it's not just the fruit of the Spirit. That's, that's already a big challenge. And that is where we can easily see where we stand. But it is also fruit that we can see somehow in our lives, that the Lord uses us. Do we have this urge in us that we say, Lord, use me. I want to be for your glory. It is for your honor. Again, motives need to be careful. Why do we want fruit? There's a danger. But it's not a reason not to have that question clear before our eyes. Lord, please use me. What is hindering in my life so that I can be used? Brother and sister. There's so many possibilities for sisters. And the women out there today, they need to be reached predominantly through the sisters. That's a reality. And when you look, I said, people get saved in personal conversation. When you look at pastoral work, that's how it happens. There is a lot of things. When, you, when it comes to assembly growth, there is a lot of things that happen in the homes and that happens in a realm where sisters are especially powerful and can be used by the Lord in a special way. And only if brothers and sisters work together, each one taking and fulfilling the role that God has shown in His Word, only then we will see rich blessing. Only then we'll see assemblies that grow. Only then we'll see that our kids continue in the good path. That is a must. And if we think that we are more clever than the Lord, and that we can take over the things of the world, the thinking of the world, 
the role perversion of this world. If we think we can do that, we will reap what we have sown. That's the reality. Now there's one final thought that I would like to share with you. And it's also a solemn one. I said the Holy Spirit lives in us individually. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, we find that also the assembly is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is there collectively. So there is not only the fact that the Lord Jesus is in our midst. This concerns his authority, okay? The presence of the Lord Jesus in the midst of the two or three. This is one thing. But I don't see it as just a spiritual uh, thing that we could say the, 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 the Lord Jesus is in our midst through the Holy Spirit only. To me, when he says, for where two or three are gathered to my name, there I am in the midst of them, I take it literally. The Lord Jesus is there. But then in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you also see that the Holy Spirit is in the midst of the assembly. You can see that the assembly is the temple of the Holy Spirit in a collective sense. And now, that has also to do with that which the Spirit ministers through the gifts to the assembly for the edification. Okay? But the point I would like to make is this. It doesn't... It doesn't matter now if you have the Lord or the Spirit before you in the midst of the assembly. I just would like to underline the solemnity. The solemnity of the fact that divine persons are in the assembly. Saints, when we come together for the breaking of bread, do we realize that he is there? Do we realize that? I really wonder if we do. Because it will lead us in all the little aspects of that which goes with assembly meetings. Punctuality. Because if he's there, I I don't know what time he arrives actually the Lord Jesus. He says, where two or three are gathered in my name. So I would think that he's there, probably waiting before the first even arrives here, because he knows that two or three will be gathered. That's how I look at it. Saints, it will clearly guide us as brothers and sisters in our worship We will be so dependent, we will be so solemnly before him, we will be waiting for his leading. Just as we would like to be waiting for his leading all our lives, for every step that we do in our lives. But when we come together unto the name of the Lord Jesus, we know there he is in the midst. And saints, please, I think we need to come back sometimes to this reality a little more. We need to realize the Lord, the blessed Lord that gave his life for me is there. He's there. He's there every Sunday morning. He's there in every prayer meeting. Why would I come why would I come on Sunday and not to the prayer meeting if the Lord is there the same? The same Lord is there. Why? Why do I make differences? And how do I come? And have I judged myself before I take part in the bread and the wine? We're so concerned sometimes, and rightly so, when it comes to who is being received at the Lord's table and the defilement associations and things that that are realities that we need to consider. But how about me on a Sunday morning? Am I coming here in a state where I defile the rest? 
Saints, this is very serious things, and I 